Well, good evening, everyone. Hope you're opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 20 tonight. Acts chapter 20, as we talk about the fact that it is more blessed to give than to uh, receive. Hope everybody is staying uh, warm today in the Florida blizzard. And uh, you've all survived pretty well so far. That's great. Uh, Acts 20, you know, it is the season for giving and receiving in our culture. Of course, we don't celebrate Christmas as a religious holiday. That's a man-made holiday. But it is certainly the time when people are thinking about giving gifts and receiving gifts. And so I thought it would be very fitting for us to think about this subject. In Acts 20, we have Paul on his way back to Jerusalem after his third missionary journey. And he stops in Miletus to meet with the elders of Ephesus that he had formed a relationship with over the three years that he spent serving with them. And so in this uh, long speech that he gives them, which we're going we're gonna to read in a moment, he says toward the end of that in verse 35, "...and everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive." Here Paul mentions a teaching of Jesus that is not recorded in the Gospels. You remember at the very end of John, the very last verse in the Gospel of John, he said there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Here's one of those things that Jesus did or said that was not written in John's Gospel or by Matthew, Mark, or Luke either. And Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, shares what I believe to be one of the richest, deepest sayings of Jesus that is especially worthy of our attention at this time of year. You know, I've shared with you all before that I grew up um, with my dad as an only child. And what you may not have known is that on my dad's side, I was also the only grandchild which meant Christmas was all about me. (laughs) I was the only one to buy gifts for. I mean, yeah, they bought gifts for each other, but I was the focus. And I remember the greatest thing about Christmas is that I would just put this list together and give to Santa, and then somehow I'd just get everything that I put on my list. It was wonderful. I was terribly spoiled. To me, Christmas was all about receiving and never about giving. One writer said something that I could relate to. He said... When I heard this verse as a kid, I thought to myself, well, then I should just let everyone else be blessed by giving to me. (laughs) Receiving feels great. It feels wonderful to get stuff from people. And I must admit, shamefully so, that I never once thought to myself as a child, boy, I am just receiving way too much. (laughs) And I need to stop all this receiving. I need to do much more, much more giving. And thankfully, I grew out of that. But some people never do. Some people not only believe it's better to receive during the holidays, but that it's always better to receive than to give. So I want to ask the question tonight, what did Jesus mean by this? How is it that it really is more blessed to give than to receive? And again, I want to make a disclaimer that I'm not teaching about Christmas as a God-ordained holiday. There's nothing in the Bible about Christmas. It's man-made, and I understand some Christians are even offended by it and have a problem with it because it has its origins in paganism and Catholicism. So this is not a sermon about getting in the Christmas spirit. This is a sermon about getting in the Jesus spirit. This is a sermon about getting in the Holy Spirit. Spirit, getting in the spirit of the Apostle Paul here in this text in Acts 20. And what I want to do is read the larger section of this text in Acts 20 from verse 17 to 38. It is a lengthy passage of Scripture. I'm never going to apologize for reading Scripture publicly. But I do this lengthy reading because in this text, we see that Paul isn't really talking about Christmas presents. (laughs) Though giving people presents could certainly be an application. He's talking about so much more. He said to them, he said, I worked hard in this manner. And what I want us to do as we read this text is to ask ourselves, when Paul was in Ephesus for three years, how did he practice this principle? That it is more blessed to give than to receive. How did Paul give to the Ephesians when he was there for three years? Let's read beginning in verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, 
You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God into the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He Himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when He had said these things, He knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. Do you see, Paul didn't say, look, when I was with you, once a year I made sure to give you all presents. (laughs) No, he gave them so much more. Verse 18, he gave them his time. Verse 19, he stayed with them even through trials and tears. In verse 20, he spoke to them profitable things from God's word, even when it was dangerous to do so. Verse 27, he gave them the whole counsel of God. Verse 28 through 30, he gave them warnings about false teachers who didn't want to give to them at all, but only wanted to take from them. Verse 31, he cared enough to admonish them when they were in sin, even though it took an emotional toll on him. Verse 34, even though he had a right to be paid as a preacher, and I think the Ephesian brethren paid him sometimes, mostly he he worked with his own hands, not only to give and to provide for his own needs, but to give to the needs of his traveling companions. And remember, the backdrop for this entire speech to the elders. Verse 22 says that Paul was on his way to Jerusalem, but he doesn't say why. But we know from other passages that Paul right now, as he's giving this speech to the elders, is on his way to Jerusalem to give the financial collection that he has just spent his entire third missionary journey collecting from multiple churches. And then he says, I don't really even know what's going to happen to me when I get to Jerusalem, but I'm ready not only to be in prison, I'm ready to give even my life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. My point, brethren, is that when Paul says it is more blessed to give than to receive, it wasn't just a saying for Paul. It wasn't just a once a year thing for Paul during the holidays. It was a way of life. And he charges those elders there in Acts 20 to to give to the flock in the way that he gave to them. And then he reminds them of Jesus who really charges all of us to give more than we receive. But my problem with this text is that, it, you know, it seems like a lot of giving by Paul. seems like it would have been very exhausting, very draining physically and emotionally and financially. And so how in the world could that kind of self-sacrificial giving actually be more blessed than receiving? We'll consider five reasons and then we'll make some application at the end. Giving pleases God. This saying of Jesus is kind of like in the Beatitudes on the Sermon on the Mount. There he listed truths like, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Phrased another way, you could add Acts 20 verse 35 to that list in this way. Blessed are those who give. That's important. Because the word blessed means that we have God's approval. And as a result, we're happy in our souls. Blessedness is the supreme happiness that comes from knowing that our Heavenly Father is pleased with us. In fact, before this meeting with the elders at Miletus, Paul had written the letter of 2 Corinthians encouraging them to be givers, to contribute to the collection for the needy saints in Jerusalem that Paul was on his way uh, to serve. And so he says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must do as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We often say that right before the contribution. I think that's a great time to say that verse because that's the exact context in which it was found. But it's also a general principle that God loves a cheerful giver, not just a financial giver, but a giver of time, a giver of our energy, a giver of our emotion and our love to one another. Adam recently preached a sermon asking the question, can we please God? And the answer was a resounding yes. Of course we can please God. And Adam gave some different reasons for that. Here's another reason why we know we can please God. It's because giving pleases Him. I want to call your attention to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, when Adam preached, he preached on an earlier part of this section about the parable of the talents where Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant, to show that we can be pleasing to God. Well, I want to point out something in addition to that. In verse 34 of Matthew 25, then the king will say to those on his right, this is the judgment scene, by the way, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, why were they blessed or, or blessed? Verse 35, for... I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came and you came to me. They were blessed because they were givers. When we spend our lives as givers and not takers, we are well pleasing to God. And I have no doubt that Paul, Paul felt very blessed to be a part of the work at Ephesus because he gave to them for, throughout those three years and he knew that that was well-pleasing to his Lord. Secondly, giving makes us more like Jesus. The more we live like Jesus, the more we become like Jesus. Paul lived in Ephesus and acted like Jesus. I, I think about Paul spending three years teaching there despite persecution from the Jews. And Jesus spent three years teaching people the counsel of God despite persecution. Paul served in humility and tears. Jesus served in humility and tears. Paul was willing to give up his life in service to the Ephesians. Jesus was willing to give up his life in service to us. The more Paul gave of himself, the more he became like his master. I want you to notice another passage in John 13. When Jesus girds himself with a towel, and he bends down to wash the disciples' feet. I don't think I ever noticed this part of this section of Scripture. But in verse 12, it says, When he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an, an example that you also should do as I did to you. Verse 16, Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. And here's the part I missed. I never noticed verse 17. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus, yes, we need to follow his example as a servant. But the connection that I've never seen in this verse is that we're actually not just like Jesus when we do it, but we're also blessed when we do it. Yes, being like Jesus is a part of it, but it's also we're, we're blessed by God, just as Jesus was blessed because he got to serve. And he didn't only give up uh, you know, this, this effort to wash the feet. He also gave up his exalted position as teacher and took on the role of a slave. And when we do that for others and we give and put others first, we too can become humble like our master. 
In 2 Corinthians 8, when Paul wrote that letter, he told them, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. I think about how easy it could have been for Jesus to be a taker. He could have said, I'm the Son of God, and here's an awesome miracle to prove it. And think about the awesome miracles he could have done just to prove his, his sonship and to prove the fact that, hey, all of you, now that, I'm, now that you know I'm the Son of God, I want you to go get me stuff. Go do things for, for me. Go, go get palm fronds and you know, hold them over me for, for shade and go get me food and go get me water. He didn't, he didn't say that. In fact, he said the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And Paul says he, he became poor so that everyone else around him would be rich spiritually. And what we learn from Jesus, too, is that that's the best way to live in order to find true fulfillment in this life. To find, yeah, receiving is nice, it feels good, but it's shallow in terms of providing us what we really need in this life. The true spiritual fulfillment comes from giving, not from receiving. That's how God designed us. And Jesus showed us how to get that fulfillment. Someone once said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And that's exactly right. And when we give, we make a life like our Lord's life. Thirdly, giving shares God's grace. Why would Paul work so hard and give himself so graciously, not only to the Ephesians for three years, but to everybody? What was it that drove Paul to work so hard at giving to people? Look in 1 Corinthians 15. He gives us the answer there. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, he says this, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul says his motivation for giving was the grace of God, and as he gave to others, it was actually the grace of God working through him in his deeds. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God is the ultimate giver of all good gifts, and he doesn't change. Years ago, there was a military man on his way back from a barracks in London when he saw a little orphan boy in tattered clothing staring into the window of a bakery. His nose was pressed up and he was looking at the pastries. You could just tell he wanted one so bad. And this man had compassion on the boy. And he, and he said, you know, he bent down on one knee and he spoke to this boy on his level. And he said, would you like one of those? And he said, oh boy, would I? Yes, sir. And, and so he went in and he got him a bag uh, of pastries and he came out and handed it to the boy and, and told the boy to, you know, have a great day. And as he was walking away, he felt a tug on his coat and the, and it was the boy, and, and he turns around, and, and this boy asks him, he said, Mister, are you God? <laughs> you know, it wasn't really that he did all that much, just bought him some pastries. But the point is, even, even these small gestures of giving to people gives them a taste of the character and the grace of God. And so I love the way Paul lays out when he's asking for the collection in 2 Corinthians again. Look in, verse, look in chapter 8 in 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> we wouldn't have time to look at all the times he uses the word grace, but listen to how he describes the actual work that's going on. He calls it a work of grace. He says in 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 and 2, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. So what, what Paul is saying is that when the Macedonian brethren gave, they were actually giving the grace of God. He says, I want you to know about the grace of God that has been given by the churches of Macedonia. And then in verse 6, when he urges the brethren in Corinth to give to this collection, he calls it a gracious work. 
is the language he uses. And then at the very end of chapter 9, which is all part of this, these two chapters are about this financial collection, listen to the language he uses there in verse 13. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The entire basis for Paul asking these Gentile churches to make this contribution, to make this generous gift, was because of God's indescribably gracious gift to them in Christ. He calls this gift a gracious work because their giving would be a tangible way to share God's grace with others. And that's exactly what Paul was doing for those Ephesian brethren there in Ephesus for three years. Fourthly, giving loosens our grip on this world. Paul says in Acts 20 and verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. Paul had no reason to take from them because he had this giving attitude where he didn't care about the world. He didn't want their silver. He didn't want their gold or clothes. And of course, that was a stark contrast to the false teachers that he said, when the false teachers come, they're going to be like savage wolves who only want to fill their bellies by devouring the flock. In the Bible, false teachers are commonly filled with greed and covetousness, and they believe it's far more blessed to receive than to give. But giving can actually combat that kind of greed and covetousness. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 9 again, listen to what he tells them in verse 5. He says, Arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. One of the reasons he urges the Corinthians to participate in this collection sooner rather than later is because he knew the longer they held on to that money, the harder it would be to let it go because of covetousness. He knew the longer they kept taking up a collection every first day of the week and just storing up that money, just hoarding up that money for themselves, the harder it was going to be to give up. And that would bring shame on that congregation by all the other churches that actually did give. I think about Jesus in Matthew 6 and verse 20 when he tells us to store up our treasure not in heaven, or excuse me, not in heaven, not on earth where moth and rust destroy, but in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. But then you remember what he said in verse 21? He said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When we're focused on receiving, we're laying up treasures here on the earth, and our hearts are becoming more and more attached to the things of this world. But the more we give, the less these worldly things will matter to us, and the more our hearts will be set on heaven. And finally, giving enriches our relationships. You just look at the way Paul interacted with those elders, falling on his knees with them and praying with them and crying with them, and they embraced each other and kissed each other. If Paul was a savage wolf, like the false teachers, a taker and a receiver, that kind of relationship with the elders would never have been possible. Yet these elders are deeply grieved that they may may never see Paul again because Paul had given so much to them and they had given so much to Paul. In that same chapter about the collection, he tells them at the end that they also by prayer on your behalf will yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Yes, the money is going to be helpful because they're needy Christians. They need the money. He says, but when you give them this gift, it's actually going to create a yearning for you, an appreciation for you and their relationship with you in Christ. Remember, this, this collection was for Jewish Christians taken up by Gentile churches. And Paul knew there was a purpose to that. It wasn't just about the money. It was about bridging a relational gap that he knew existed between two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, who normally outside of Christ would have been enemies. But Paul knew that when they gave this contribution to them, it would actually bridge that relational gap and create unity and harmony and love between the Jews and the Gentile Christians. Proverbs 18.16 says, A man's gift makes room for him 
and brings them before great men. Giving opens doors for us in our relationships with people because it shows them that we care. You show me a relationship where only one person in the relationship is doing all the giving and the other one's doing all the taking, and I'll tell you, or I'll show you a miserable relationship. I'll show you a relationship that is on the brink of destruction. But you show me a relationship where both people are giving to one another constantly and have this mindset that it is more blessed to give than receive. That's a deep, meaningful, flourishing, lifelong relationship because giving enriches our relationships just like it enriched the relationship between Paul and the Ephesian elders and just like the way it enriches our relationships with God and with Jesus Christ. And so let's talk application. What do we do with all this? Obviously, you could have taken some application uh, through those things already, but here's some practical things to do to put in action. Give first. Sometimes the only time we give to people is after we've received something from them. And then we feel maybe some sense of obligation. Well, I guess I need, to, I need to be the one to give now. But if it's more blessed to give than to receive, why wait around to be the receiver? Why not take the initiative? Why not try to beat people to the chase and give first? Give to someone before they give to you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Secondly, when you receive, give. You know, when we become habitual receivers, we run the risk of storing up treasures for ourselves on earth, as we talked about, coveting things in this world, not being blessed by God. A great way to fight against that is to make it a goal that every time we receive something, whether it's money or a present or an encouraging card or just an attentive ear to listen to our problems, go find someone else to give to. So instead of hoarding all of the receiving, we end up reflecting all of the receiving off onto other people. And I say find someone else because, you know, if you just give back to the same person who gave to you, that can create this endless cycle where you two are the only ones ever giving to each other and you don't give to anybody else. <clears throat> and I'm also not saying that it has to be a one-to-one -one comparison, like, well, if someone gives you $100, that means you have to go find someone else and give them $100. That, that's not the point either. You can get creative with how you give. But the point is not to get in the habit of only ever being on the receiving end of people's generosity, but instead to reflect that giving heart back out into the world. What a great exercise for children. I needed that. I was a spoiled brat when I was a kid. I'm grateful I, I grew out all that. But imagine if my dad would have said, hey, you got you got." 10 presents this year for Christmas. Now let's find 10 people to give to so we can reflect a giving heart. I probably would have thrown a tantrum about that, but it would have been good for me because it would have taught me I need to, I need to reflect when I receive. I need to, to deflect what I receive out onto other people so that I don't just become a receiver. I also learn to give as well. Thirdly, give to meet needs. Giving people presents for the holidays is really fun, and it's, it's a really nice thing, but usually we're just getting people things that they want, not necessarily things that they need, especially when we talk about kids. In fact, uh, one writer joked that the worst thing you could do for a child on Christmas is to give them something useful. That's true. That, that's how I felt. Socks were useful. I didn't, want, I didn't want useful. I wanted fun and enjoyable and short, you know, short uh, pleasure span. But while giving to meet people's need, uh, wants is nice, it's more of a shallow, superficial kind of giving. That's why in Acts 20, Paul didn't mention giving the brethren presents. All right? I didn't see anywhere where he said, oh yeah, I just got, got you presents. Presents aren't a bad thing. It's just the giving that Paul did was a deeper, more meaningful kind of giving in that he met people's deepest needs, not only by giving them the gospel, in all of its fullness, but by giving them his time, his love, his consideration, his prayer, his emotions, his life. And the greatest gift we can give people is to help them meet some need, whether it's financial or, or spiritual or physical or emotional. And finally, apply this verse, Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive, to every relationship. I'm not married, but I'll use the term our, <laughs> what would our marriages look like if both husband and wife lived every day by this principle that it is more blessed to give than to receive? What if employers and employees applied this principle in the workplace? Or one person is trying to outgive the other person, or one person is trying to give first 
not only in marriage, but in the workplace? Or what if we applied these principles to our friendships or to our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Can you imagine how much closer our relationships would be? What if we applied it to our relationship with God? You see, I, I think in relationships especially, it is the most tempting to just sit back and let the other person do all the giving. And I'll just do the receiving. Especially when that other one in the relationship is God. <laughs> because he's, so, he's such a good giver. And he's so great at giving. It's so easy to just become a receiver of God's blessings. Same thing perhaps in, in marriage. You, just, you have a, a kind spouse and it's very easy maybe to take advantage of their kindness. They're always giving to me. That's great. But am I giving back to them? When you reverse that and you become a giver and not a receiver, it changes everything for the better. And it will not be long before we understand exactly what Jesus meant when he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Would you take out your songbooks, please? <laughs> it's kind of strange after a sermon like that to do what I'm about to do, and that is to ask you to receive. Because if you're not a Christian, I'm asking you to receive the grace of God tonight. Receive the gift that Jesus has given you on the cross. And the point of the sermon was not to tell us that we should never receive. That anytime somebody gives something to us, we need to just say, well, no, I'm sorry, I can't ever receive. No, that's not, that's not the point. Especially in the context of receiving the grace of God. Because the truth is we'll never really understand giving. We'll never really understand giving the depth of it, what it really means until we first receive the gift of God, the indescribable gift of God that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. You can receive that tonight. If you'll believe in Jesus, you'll be willing to confess Him as Lord and repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you've done that and you've, and you've wandered off and you've become a taker in your relationship with God, God is doing all the giving, we're doing all the receiving. We're taking Him for granted. And we're taking advantage of Him. Let's, let's reverse that. Let's make up our minds to change, to become a giver to God and to others, to share His grace with others and to appreciate the grace that He shared with us. If we can help you change tonight to become a giver or a receiver of God's grace tonight, come forward, let us know while we stand and sing.